Yo, I'm Vane Bandit, and today, uh, <laughs> I'm finally making this video? Yes, it's here. It is time. The promised, fabled video on Kane Roberts' fourth album, Unsung Radio. Kane's ultimate return to the music world, putting himself back into the spotlight once and for all. And hey, I get to start 2024 with a Kane-related video. That'll have to be a tradition from now on. But without further ado, let's step into the light and dive into this double whammy comeback. So let's set the stage. What's Unsung Radio? Well, Unsung Radio is the fourth album release from former Alice Cooper guitarist Kane Roberts, which was initially released on October 12, 2012, as a limited double CD package consisting of a reissue of its predecessor, the Phoenix Down album Under a Wild Sky, and a slew of unreleased songs from Kane's past, alongside some commentary tracks recorded specifically for this release. Additionally, two different single disc editions would release later on, one releasing on November 26, 2012, and one releasing on June 24, 2013. The former of these releases would be the version found on streaming services, and the latter actually has the four bonus tracks off of the 2012 States and Sinners reissue. I'll know what songs are on what releases as I review them, of course. As some editions lack certain songs, or have additional songs that aren't even on the two-disc set as I have mentioned. All in all, Unsung Radio is generally a mix of Phoenix Down and unreleased tracks, regardless of what one of the three editions one owns. Now, I don't actually own this album. In fact, it is the one Kane album that I don't own. That's because, for some reason, it is stupidly fucking expensive online. I know, the rarity factor. But even the one disc editions are hard to find. That's not the point of this video, though. Anyways, now that I've nailed down the general gist of Unsung Radio and its contents, it is time for me to form the timeline of this album. And in doing so, I need to confront a theory I have had in relation to Unsung Radio. Let's jump all the way back to 2009. On Kane's old website, kanerobertscom archives showed me that there was a URL under the title of relive underscore download. Ah, yes, relive the end. A release that I have mentioned in a few other videos of mine covering Kane's career. It officially be put on Kane's site properly in 2011, with the earliest archive being dated July 13th, 2011, and was a reissue of Under a Wild Sky. It would remain visible on Kane's site until the release of the final one disc release of Unsung Radio, with the earliest archive's date for that edition of Unsung Radio on Kane's site being June 25th, 2013 a day after its release. The relive underscore download URL would not be directly accessible, but seems to have still existed until 2016, with the latest archive of it being dated March 10th, 2016. At first glance, one would assume that Relive the End and Unsung Radio were either closely related to each other, or were outright one and the same at some point. But for a while, I didn't have any concrete answers. Asking fellow fans online led me nowhere, as they were in the same boat that I was. They hadn't heard of Relive prior, and figured that Relive and Unsung were one and the same in some regard. So my sights were set on the two brains behind Unsung Radio. Kane Roberts and Bruce Mee, the latter of which was involved with the Under a Wild Sky album and Phoenix Down through the Now and Then label. I do believe I neglected to mention this in my video on Phoenix Down and Under a Wild Sky, and for that I apologize. I'm not sure how I neglected to mention this, but better late than never. As for Relive the End, I first asked Bruce about it, and he had never heard of it until I asked about it. Something that struck me as odd with my theory in mind. After all, Kane has stated that Bruce was the main brainchild behind Unsung Radio. If Bruce wasn't even aware of Relive the End, something was up, and I needed answers. So now, my sights were set on Kane alone. And you know what I did? I asked him. At first he was a bit confused, which was fair given his memory isn't the best with these things. Lucky for me, not only do I have a photographic memory, 
but I also had sources to clarify things. And then the answer was given to me on a silver platter. And guess what? Guess fucking what? Relive the End in Unsung Radio? There is no fucking connection. That's right, you heard me. One of like, literally two times that I applied the tried and true logic of Kane has no coincidences in his career, I was wrong. And maybe I should have figured that was the case sooner. The fact that Relive the End was replaced by the last edition of Unsung Radio. The fact that Bruce Me didn't know what the fuck Relive the End even was. And sure, okay, maybe the former is excusable, given that I hadn't nailed down dates on when specific editions of Unsung Radio had released. But still, I can't even say, oh, maybe Relive the End planted the seeds for Unsung Radio in Kane's head, because Kane outright told me that it was coincidence. All of it was coincidence. There is no fucking connection. Unsung Radio and Relive the End are not related, never were related, and never will be related. By the way, this has me agitated to such an insane degree because this was the roadblock in all of this. My theory on Relive the End and Unsung Radio was the one thing I wanted clarification on before doing anything for this video. And it was just a whole bunch of nothing. I can't even be upset at anyone but myself. Kane didn't do anything wrong, Bruce didn't do anything wrong, and you can't blame an inanimate object like an album for your own fuck up. So let this be a correction to me erroneously having made the claim that Unsung Radio and Relive the End were connected, because I have very foolishly done so, and I am correcting myself now. Relive the End and Unsung Radio are two totally separate things. Moving on to the tale of Unsung Radio itself. As stated before, there were two brains behind this project, Kane Roberts and Bruce Mee. Bruce, who was behind the Now and Then record label, would give Kane the idea of reissuing Under a Wild Sky after the initial release hadn't gone as well as they had hoped. Kane took him up on this, and they decided that they could sweeten the deal by adding some unreleased tracks of Kane's, demos and outtakes from various eras of Kane's career. Furthermore, Kane would add some commentary tracks on the second disc alongside those unreleased songs, and from there, Unsung Radio was a go. The two-disc set was sold mostly by Bruce, while Kane sold the one-disc editions himself. As such, the three editions would be under different labels. The two-disc set was under Firefest Records, as that was Bruce's label, while the two single-disc editions were both under Unsung Records. And from there, the rest is history. A very simple development, not too complicated. Something I'm a bit grateful for, given Kane's propensity for having totally off-the-wall chains of events go down. And hey, I don't even have to bitch about a record label in advertising this time, because it was all done by Kane and Bruce online. And it was done pretty well, I'd say. For a brief moment, Kane's recurring struggle of having a record label mess things up and screw him over was a novelty of the past. And then it happened again with the new normal. Kane can't catch a break. Expect a bandit rant when I cover the new normal. It's gonna happen, whether you like it or not. Now, that's all the background behind the album itself. I know it's not nearly as lengthy as something like Saints and Sinners, but hey, it makes my job easier, doesn't it? So let's quickly cover the three editions of this album and their track lists before I dive into the songs themselves. Because there's a lot of them to cover. We first have the double CD edition of Unsung Radio, released on October 12th, 2012 under Firefest Records. The first disc is a reissue of Under a Wild Sky, with a rather interesting tracklist to say the least, because it differs a bit from any other edition of Under a Wild Sky. The tracklist for disc 1 is Reckless, Walking on Shadows, which is stated to be a remixed version, Love Gone Wrong, Blind, Rain, Alive and Well, Walk, I Want It Again, in Another Life, and Rebel Heart. Right, so a few things of note. Walking on Shadows is here. Nice. For those unaware, this song, while erroneously stated by Kane to have not been released at all prior to Unsung Radio, 
actually did have a release on the Japanese edition of Under a Wild Sky. But there is a considerable difference between the two. When overlaying them on top of one another, they actually desync after a certain point, even though I made sure they started at the exact same time. And it's mostly noticeable before Kane starts singing, but it starts off pretty much immediately desyncing, which is really weird. I think I'll upload a video of the two versions overlaid, with each version playing in one ear, so you can really hear how they desync. And I'll cover the differences more once I review that song in a bit, but I wanted to make it known that the remixing is very much noticeable. Another interesting thing here is that while Walking on Shadows gets a spot on this release, the 1999 re-recording of the Saints and Sinners song, You Always Want It, which is also found on the Japanese release of Under a Wild Sky, does not get a spot here. I mean, that's a given if you know my tale of fighting to obtain that song to get uploaded online, because it was nowhere online for a long time, but now is not the time to cover that story. And here's why I feel maybe the most confusing choice. The song Neverland, which is found on the original release of Under a Wild Sky, is not here at all. For whatever reason, this song has just been omitted? I'm not entirely sure why, though my assumption is Kane was insistent on having Walking on Shadows be here and needed to replace the song, and Neverland was the song that just so happened to be on the chopping block, which is a shame because I do like that song. I don't know what the actual reasoning for that is. As a side note, I have covered the original release of Under a Wild Sky here on my channel, so if you're interested in that piece of Kane's career, go give it a watch. Now, Disc 2's tracklist. It actually starts with a commentary track, which immediately gives you a taste of that aspect of this release. The tracks are Commentary 1, City of Pain, which has also been referred to as In the City of Pain, I Bleed For You, Guitar Stroke 1, which is a quick snippet of Kane riffing on his guitar, Guns of Paradise, Commentary 2, One Step to Heaven, Blue Highway, Commentary 3, Wrong, A Demo of the Song Rain, Guitar Stroke 2, Self Control, Commentary 4, A Demo of the Song in Another Life, Commentary 5, I'm Waiting for You, Louise, and Commentary 6. Altogether, this edition has 29 tracks. Now, let's cover the first of the single disc releases. Released on November 26, 2012, on Unsung Records, this is half under a Wild Sky tracks, half unreleased tracks, which is a result of Kane himself cutting down the tracklist and making it cheaper to buy than the initial two-disc release. Additionally, this is the edition that is used for its release on streaming platforms. The tracklist is Reckless, I Bleed For You, Walk, Guns Of Paradise, One Step To Heaven, Blue Highway, In The City Of Pain, Rain, Walking on Shadows, with the subtitle sung for Japan as opposed to being simply referred to as a remix, and In Another Life. Altogether, this edition has 10 tracks. Next is the second and final single disc edition of Unsung Radio, released on June 24th, 2013 under Unsung Records. Presumably also edited by Kane, the tracklist is Reckless, House Burning Down, also referred to as This House is Burning Down, Walk, Dirty Blonde, One Step to Heaven, Guns of Paradise, Wrong, and Another Life, The City of Pain. You're telling me this song has three fucking titles? Jesus fuck. Okay, moving on. The City of Pain, also referred to as In the City of Pain and City of Pain, White Trash, I Bleed for You, Louise, and Rain. Altogether, this edition has 13 tracks. So, how many songs does Unsung Radio have as a whole? If you smashed all of these editions together, how many tracks would there be? Well, here's your answer. Reckless, Walking on Shadows, Love Gone Wrong, Blind, Rain, Alive and Well, Walk, I Want It Again, In Another Life, Rebel Heart, Commentary 1, City of Pain, I Bleed For You, Guitar Stroke 1, Guns of Paradise, Commentary 2, One Step to Heaven, Blue Highway, Commentary 3, Wrong, A Demo of the Song Rain, Guitar Stroke 2, Self Control, Commentary 4, A Demo of the Song in Another Life, Commentary 5, I'm Waiting for You, Louise, Commentary 6, House Burning Down, Dirty Blonde, and White Trash. 
That is 32 songs. Okay, 24 songs, technically, if you take away the commentary and guitar stroke tracks. But still, it's a hefty package. Now, it's time for me to review all of these tracks. Or, almost all of them. Because I will not be covering most of Under a Wild Sky, as I have already covered this album extensively. But I will cover Walking on Shadows, as promised, and will bring up the relevant final releases in regards to the songs that are here in demo form. Additionally, I will not cover House Burning Down, White Trash, or Dirty Blonde in this video, as I have covered those in my video on Saints and Sinners. Additionally, my coverage on certain songs will be a bit more brief, as a few songs of Unsung Radio have origins in Saints and Sinners, and as such, were covered in my video on that album. I won't completely gloss over them, don't you worry, but it will be a little more brief for those in particular. And much like Under a Wild Sky, yes, I've done a video on Saints and Sinners. Go give it a watch when you've got the chance. Without further ado, let's jump into these songs. We start with Walking on Shadows, which while I have covered it with Under a Wild Sky, I feel it is necessary to cover it here, as the remix is interesting to say the least. This song is available on the two disc and first single disc release, although it is absent from the second single disc release. I'll of course provide some background on this song. Being the originator of the song Too Far Gone on Saints and Sinners, this song has been kicking around in some shape or form for some time be it in Too Far Gone, The Lords of Tantras, and Under a Wild Sky's Japanese release, Walking on Shadows is a song with a very rich and lengthy history. Inspired by the tragedy of the bombing of Hiroshima, Japan, this song is a heart-wrenching one. But with that covered, I feel it is necessary to highlight the differences between the two versions of this song. The first thing I caught immediately was that the length of the songs are different. At first it seems like a slight difference, but truth be told, the unsung radio version fades out. I'd say it fades out earlier, but the Under a Wild Sky version doesn't fade out at all. I'm not sure why Kane felt a fade out was necessary, but it is interesting to have a song where you get to hear the full ending of it, as I have heard too many songs where I wish it didn't fully fade out at a certain point, because you can hear some really good parts as it fades. Here's the endings of both of these versions for your reference. As another thing to note, if you overlay the two versions on top of each other, eventually they seem to desync, and it happens pretty quickly too. In fact, it seems to desync immediately, but is most noticeable once Kane starts singing, because once Kane is singing, there's a clear timing difference, making a sort of echo. That's because Unsung Rayo slows this song down slightly. I'm not sure why this is. This made it hard for me to properly compare certain things in this song, as I had one version play in each ear. Not easy to do when it desyncs so dramatically. Lucky for me, I had a friend of mine make the tempos of both versions match, and that made things much easier for both of us to catch certain differences, which I'll note here. For one, this seems to be a totally different vocal take. There's a few indicators, and I'll play a few of them now. Filled with strangers, distant voices call. The empty streets are filled with strangers. 
strangers, distant voices call. This was the first time I had actually compared the two versions in depth. I just took the remix term at face value and assumed that the only difference was the fade out being added to the unsung radio version. Nope! Another thing about unsung radio I was wrong about. Kane. Sir. Mr. Roberts. Beefy guitar gamer man. My favorite man in the world. You are killing me. You really are. Ironically though, Kane's solos are generally unaffected otherwise. Some minor mixing differences, and of course the change to tempo, but instrumentally it's generally the same in terms of structure and progressions and all that good stuff. Which is funny given how this is noted as a remix. Which typically affects the mixing and not what take is used. Maybe Kane should have known this to be an alternate take instead, because I feel like that'd be much more appropriate. And interestingly, this song has a version that happens to be in Kane's game, The Lords of Tantras. It serves as the tile card music for the first chapter, and it actually shares lyrics with another song that appears on Unsung Radio, which I will cover when we get there. As for that version of the song, this sounds very different. For one, Kane isn't singing here. This version is sung by a woman named Karen Bernstein, who has had connections to not only Tantras, but another project that Kane would be involved in, Flesh FX. Hell, the only thing that made me certain that this wasn't just two songs with a shared title was this. Oh, and by the way, since I've mentioned both of those projects, I've made videos on both The Lords of Tantras and Flesh FX, so give them a watch if you're interested in hearing more about those. All in all, it's kind of interesting, and I wish Kane had done some sort of commentary tracks for the Under a Wild Sky songs, as not only would that have added some cool bits for my Under a Wild Sky video, but it would've also just, you know, been cool to have more info on those songs in general. Especially Walking on Shadows, given the odd situation it has now. And also, its appearance in The Lords of Tantras provides me with more curiosity. How did that happen? Like, this raises more questions about Tantras' music for me. But that's not the point of this video. Seriously, I recommend listening to both versions of this song. Because, wow. Wow. The differences are abundant. Moving on, the next song is In the City of Pain, or The City of Pain, or City of Pain. Seriously, what the fuck? Why does this song have three titles? Walking on Shadows makes sense, given the remix deal, and the main difference is a subtitle that doesn't impact the main title too severely if changed. But this? Good god! I didn't even know it had three titles when I covered it for Saints and Sinners. It would have been nice to know for that video. Anyways, City of Pain. Written by Kane Roberts, this song is available on all editions of Unsung Radio. I won't dwell on this one too terribly long, as again I covered it in the Saints and Sinners video, but I will give a rundown on it and a general review of it. Firstly, let me allow Kane to give some background here, since he did a commentary track for the song. Take it away, big guy! Okay, I'm standing outside Village Recorders in West Los Angeles. There's no way for you to know if I'm actually standing here. I may be under a bridge in East LA in my underwear for all you know, but hey, take your pick. Anyway, we recorded uh, City of Pain here along with, with a few other songs. My most treasured memory of this session 
Um, I was testing the mic and I noticed a rather unusual looking pop screen. Pop screens uh, are these little filters that they put in front of the microphones when anybody records. And it's supposed to prevent any kind of popping sounds when you sing the letter P directly into the microphones. So, um, so yeah, so I'm looking at this really strange screen, you know, it's right in my face, and I asked the engineer about it, and he said Stevie Nicks had been there with Fleetwood Mac, and she had left a pair of her pantyhose, and they cut the crotch out and wrapped it around this, um, this coat hanger, and that was the uh, pop screen. So, to be honest with you, I was okay with that. In fact, I requested it because, you know, I got a great sound. I know what you're thinking, but I chose to believe that, yes, they were hers. So, in fact, I still do believe that. I just hope they weren't Mick Fleetwoods. Anyway, so check this out. City of Pain. <laughs> yeah. Oh, geez, that story is still good. God, these never get old. Love these commentary tracks. Anyways, this song, alongside I Bleed For You and One Step To Heaven, originated from an early recording session for Saints and Sinners. A solid rock song, this song features the 1987 Criminal Justice lineup, which consists of Kane Roberts, Steve Steele, and Victor Russo. And you can really tell this is early on in the Saints and Sinners sessions, with Kane's voice in particular, either having been very early on in his vocal training, or even pre-vocal training outright. And by its instrumentation and general sound, it's also very apparent that this song is from before the direction Saints and Sinners took had been fully established. So much so that in my very early days of being a Kane fan, I thought this was a much newer Kane song. Yes, I had seriously assumed it was from 2012 alongside I Bleed For You and One Step To Heaven and all the other stuff on Unsung Radio. I mean, come on, considering I had no context or even info on Unsung Radio, let alone most of Kane's career at that point, what else was I meant to think when I listened to this album blindly? And yes, once I heard the commentary tracks and did further digging into Kane's career, I of course found that I was wrong. And well, it has led me into this rabbit hole. Seriously, this album has been a box of mysteries for me for ages. But let's not dwell on that just yet. I'll cover my experiences later. But for City of Pain, it's a song I really like, as it stirs up some vivid imagery in my head, both in how the instrumentation gives off the vibe of driving lay at night, in the lyrics further providing a setting for your mind to imagine. Imagining the church in the dark, the fire within, how Cain cries out about it being a losing game in this city of pain. I love the general holy motif in these lyrics, with lyrics like holy water running through my veins and are you the savior, promise me light in the dark, come on now baby, preach to me. The way the song opens up with the mention of the church, how prominent it is being in the pre-chorus, it's an interesting deal given the fact that not very many of Kane's songs have this topic within them. The only ones I can really think of that come before this song in Kane's timeline are If This Is Heaven and One After, which is I'm Not Looking For An Angel. And the latter is interesting given that it did wind up on Saints and Sinners, considering that City of Pain was slated to be a potential pick for Saints and Sinners as well. And I think I mentioned this in my Saints and Sinners video, but god damn the solo in this song! It's probably one of my favorite Kane solos of all time because it's so memorable to me. Once again, Kane manages to really hit the mark with his songwriting, and it shows with this song. And all three of its titles. Yeah, I'm still not over that. Come on, it would have been nice to know before I covered it in my Saints and Sinners video. Come on! Oh, and in recent times, it actually got used to advertise Kane's most recent t-shirt line release from Agent Royale, which is nice to see. I Bleed For You is next, written by Kane Roberts. Available on all editions of Unsung Radio, this is from the Saints and Sinners sessions, alongside City of Pain and One Step to Heaven. As such, I have covered this in my Saints and Sinners video, but I'll provide a quick rundown. This song has origins from right before Saints and Sinners was in full swing, and features the criminal justice lineup as you'd expect it, given how it was recorded alongside City of Pain and One Step to Heaven. I'll read a Facebook post from Kane where he discusses this song in more depth. Here's a sample from the 10 unreleased song bonus CD that 
includes Kane's Phoenix Down recordings. Bleed was recorded at EMI Studios in Hollywood and features the drummer from my first album, Victor Ruzzo. Again, right before the Saints album. Not mastered yet, but still sounds pretty hot. This song I remember using my Jackson for the rhythm guitar parts and my Kraber for the soloing. One take for pretty much everything, vocals included. EMI has a nice studio right in the heart of Hollywood, and we just felt it had such an LA rock sound we needed to be there. The bonus CD will feature lots of extras that we'll tell you about as soon as they're locked down. Ah yes, we get to know exactly what guitars were used here. Sick! And hey, all in one take. That adds to how good this song is, if you ask me. It sounds this good, and it's in one go? That's a faded moment! Well, now I wonder which Kramer did he use? The flame one or his bloodied lightning bolt one? I kinda hope it's the latter. It's always been a favorite for me. It was a favorite for Kane too, so it makes sense. As for the song itself, it's another rocking track that shows off the development of Saints and Sinners, with a very powerful vocal performance from Kane, where you can hear the desperation in his voice as he cries out, I'll bleed for you, baby, and I die for you. Something that is perfect for this song. The city imagery continues with this song as well, with Kane mentioning streetlights shining in the gutters. It seems City of Pain and I Bleed For You have some similar themes, which makes sense since they come from the same pre-Saints and Sinners era. I also really like the bridge of this song, because it, again, invokes images in my head for a music video for it. You crawl into the fire, but you don't feel it burning alone. Makes me just imagine Kane in the flames, his gaze intense as he sings the bridge of this song. And the way he cries out at the end of this song just hits the nail on the head. The desperation as he keeps screaming, and I die for you as the song fades out. This song really feels like it could have fit best into Saints and Sinners, given how it would mesh with songs like Twisted. That desperation, how he describes the woman he sings about. All it's really missing is keyboards, and even then, Twisted isn't particularly keyboard-heavy anyways. God, I love this song. I wish there was a middle ground album between Kane's first album and Saints and Sinners, just so I could have an album with this sound. And more Kane in my playlists. I know, typical of me. But can you blame me? No, you can't. You won't blame me. I will not let you. More Kane, please. Guitar Stroke 1 is a brief track where Kane shows off a warm-up on his guitar. It's only available on the two-disc edition of Unsung Radio, which is understandable as, hey, it's not exactly a song, and if this replaced a song slot, I think people would be annoyed about that. <laughs> Anyways, with this track, there's a brief snippet of commentary where Kane jokes around a bit, and while he doesn't talk about any songs or anything, nor is his warm-up here a part of any of his songs, I think I'll play it here for you guys, just so I can talk about it. Hey, so here's my guitar. Um, this is the type of thing that you might hear really any time of the day or night around my place. Um, if you're in the next room, you'd probably be banging on the walls telling me to shut the hell up, but, you know, it's my house, so I'm not going to stop. Yeah, this is peak Kane. Just that general attitude he has when he says, It's my house, so I'm not gonna stop. I wonder if he impulsively did this track, because it comes across as such in how he acts, and I love it. Kane could do a whole album of this, and I'd be satisfied. Kane, I hope you're listening. Just an idea for you to consider. Guns of Paradise is next, written by Kane Roberts and Jim Peterick. This song is available on all editions of Unsung Radio, which is giving a very good streak of availability in terms of the songs so far, aside from Walking on Shadows. Don't expect that to last for very much longer. Anyways, immediately we get a placement in terms of where this song originates in Kane's musical timeline. 
This is from 1992, as Kane wrote with Jim Peterick during 1992, and as such, any song with Jim Peterick as a co-writer is from this era. Post Saints and Sinners, but pre-hiatus. Unfortunately though, Kane hasn't provided further insight for this song, and it's a shame, since I'd love more insight into that era of Kane's career. As for the song itself, instrumentally, I can immediately hear the sound of the era. And this song entails Kane reminiscing on his youth, with the lost love and the thrill of his first time, firing off the guns of paradise. The keyboards add such a beautiful touch of the song, adding to that feeling of nostalgia, reminiscing on the past. This song, once again, brings vivid imagery to my mind, and honestly, you could use this for a movie plot. You tell me you can't see the scenes in your head. You try and tell me. And god, his vocals, being freshly trained after the Saints of Sinners era, which sound amazing here, especially before the solo. Which is a saxophone solo? <laughs> now that's something new for Kane. And honestly, it's pretty nice. Kane's not afraid to try new things, and when he does, he always hits the mark. Besides, with Kane's jazz influences that he has mentioned in interviews, it really does make sense. And hey, the saxophone returns at the end. All in all, this song is full of emotion and passion, and being from Kane's personal experiences, it only adds flavor to this experience. And something I want to talk about is the fact that it's a Jim Peter co-write. One may wonder, hey, why didn't this end up on Under a Wild Sky when other Jim Peter co-writes such as Love Gone Wrong or Walk did? And honestly, given the song of this song, it meshes better with the sound of songs like White Trash and Dirty Blonde. And given that this song is right between those two, with the former being from 1991 and the latter being from 1993, I think Kane may have simply felt that the vibe of the song didn't fit Under a Wild Sky. And given the general sound of Under a Wild Sky, I think I agree. While Under a Wild Sky has a large variety in sound, I mean, come on, compare Neverland to something like In Another Life, I'm not sure how well Guns of Paradise and another song that I'll cover later, that being Blue Highway, would have meshed with songs like Love Gone Wrong or Walk. It does go to show that Kane has a knack for writing a wide variety of songs with varying styles regardless of who he writes with or the era he's writing in though, so this song serves as a nice showcase of Kane's multifaceted stylings. Up next is One Step to Heaven, written by Kane Roberts. Available on all editions of Unsung Radio, this is from the Saints and Sinners sessions. And as such, I have covered it in my Saints and Sinners video, so I'll try and keep it a bit short and sweet. Arguably my favorite among the three Saints and Sinners era Unsung Radio tracks, there is a commentary track that covers the song, so take it away, Kane! Hey, so, um... Hey, so I'm here uh, on Sunset Boulevard. I pulled my car off to the side of the road because I drove by the Rainbow and it brought back all these memories, the Rainbow Bar and Grill. And um, it just brought to mind all the different realities that you go through in, in a life. I mean, one second, I'm playing strip clubs in New York, dealing cards at a blackjack game to make money. I've got a beat up old Chevy Monza the gas cage is always on empty. The next minute, I'm in Maui, writing songs with Alice Cooper. The next hour, I'm working my way down Sunset Strip with my friends in the car. Um, we're about to do an all-nighter, which was not advisable because the next day I had to be in EMI Studios. We were starting to write for the Saints and Sinners record. But um, the thought crossed my mind, you know? We're always one step away from a new life, a new reality, from living some kind of a different dream. So that's where this song comes from. We did make it in the studio the next day. We recorded this song along with a couple of others. I Bleed For You, I think, was one of them. But this song, One Step to Heaven, that's what it's about. All we got to do is step into the light. Check it out. 
Sadly, Kane has not talked about this song much online, but this commentary track alone gives plenty of insight into the inspiration of this song. We get to hear the exact inspiration of this song. How we're one step away from a new life, no matter what. Additionally, this song has an interesting connection to Walking on Shadows in terms of lyrics. Ah yes, this is the song I alluded to earlier. Yes, the one from Tantraz. I'll play a clip from it now, actually. Funny how that's connected. At the end of the day, Tantras always finds a way back to me. As for One Step to Heaven, once again, I swear to you, this song gives me such vivid images in my mind. Kane reaching for the light with the lyric, Come over here, baby, step in the light. The fact that Kane doesn't have that many music videos is a crime when I have these images in my mind. So many opportunities. So much potential! And again, this may be my favorite of the Saints and Sinners Sessions tracks on this album, because it's one I constantly come back to. And it's also unique in not having a special bridge section like City of Pain or I Bleed For You have. It stands out! And it also has the bang bang shoot the love gun lyric that made me lose my mind when I first heard it, because I had only heard Kiss use that term in songs like well, Love Gun and Bang Bang You. I love this song. So much. And can I just say the harmonization in the chorus is just stunning? And how the solo just adds to that cinematic flair? Seriously, tell me you don't see yourself getting closer to that light. Even if you're tripping and stumbling, you're gonna cross over that edge and the guitar solo provides a thrill for it. His voice sounds amazing in this song, as it always does, but fuck, this song alone makes me wonder if this was still a bit early in his vocal training, but still post-vocal training regardless. Because songs like I Bleed For You made me think it was entirely pre-vocal training, but this song, which is stated to have come from the same sessions as I Bleed For You and City Of Pain, certainly stands out in comparison to Kane's first album. You could not put One Step To Heaven on Kane's first album but you could put it on Saints and Sinners. And I know, that makes sense. It's from the early Saints and Sinners sessions, but City of Pain is a song that I feel like could actually fit on Kane's first solo album. Like, you know what I mean? But again, I wish there was an in-between album for this era. Maybe I should make a fan-made one. Ooh, that's a good idea. Ooh, that is a fun idea. Okay, I'll do it. I will. I gotta. Songs from Between Kane's first album and Saints and Sinners. It might not be a long album, but hey, I'll make it work. Blue Highway is up next, written by Kane Roberts and Jim Peterick, available on all versions of Unsung Radio. And oh boy, this song makes me cry every fucking time I hear it. Like the intro is, well, blue, somber. Kane's voice is full of emotion, singing about how he remembers the faces of the people on the blue highway. And then the part that really fucking strikes me is my daddy used to rake my heart across the coals. I was a little boy with a shattered soul, but I'd still wait for the window for him to come home. It strikes a nerve for me, as someone with a very, very strained relationship with my own father. It's something that I can personally feel with my own childhood memories. And it cuts deep. And then hearing Kane cry out in the chorus just nails it in for me. The keyboard, the acoustic guitar mixed with the electric guitar, the visuals Kane portrays in his lyrics, how everyone seems to have their own experience with this blue highway. It's a beautiful song. 
One that makes you want to experience that one strong wind to carry you along, like Kane sings about in this song. And his solo in this song doesn't overwhelm it. It's tasteful. It's emotional. It's one of those solos that proves Kane isn't just a shredding type guitarist. It shows you his versatility in such a profound and beautiful way. This song is one I need to be so careful with listening to. Because fuck, even listening to the song for this review alone had me fighting tears the whole time. And the way the song ends with a sort of choir deal with these women's voices saying walking down the blue highway, the instruments slowly settling and dying down. Kane, seriously. I said this in my Under a Wild Sky video, numerous times, specifically with songs like Love Gone Wrong, In Another Life, and Alive and Well. Kane, who hurt you? Kane, are you okay? Kane, do you need a hug? Because these lyrics are making me concerned, because this is a recurring theme in these songs now, and ultimately ended with, okay, that's it, the hug is obligatory, you don't have a choice. And Kane. Kane. That last comment is even more true now, because Jesus fucking Christ, you need it with the amount of heart-wrenching songs you have written pretty much back to back. Furthermore, I need the hug too, because seriously, this song runs my heart across the coals. You need the hug? I need the hug. It's a fair trade. Easy deal. Up next, we have Wrong, and Wrong is an interesting song, and I'm not referring to the sound when I say that, though it is a good song. Written by Kane Roberts and Arthur Funaro, this song has a lengthy history. Available on the two-disc edition and the second single-disc release, this song has origins in the unreleased Kane Roberts album, Touched. I have covered it somewhat in my Touched video, but didn't go as in-depth as I probably should have in terms of covering the evolution of it. As such, I will rectify this now. Let's first let Kane talk about this though, as he covers this song in what I think may be my favorite commentary track on this album. Yeah, this song is loaded up with some real talent. Um, it's gotta be around three in the morning. I just woke up, I was upside down on my couch, not sure what that's all about. Well, that's an original feeling. Um, but I've decided I wanted to tell you about what's wrong with me. And I don't mean me specifically, because I could go on a long time about that, but that's a whole nother CD. I mean about the song. It's called Wrong. And um, it features Kip Winger on bass, background vocals. He arranged the strings. Paul Simmons kicking the living daylights out of the drums, which he's famous for doing. Michael Wagner is recording. I mean, I'm really lucky uh, to be surrounded by talented people like this. But anyway, we went in and recorded this, um, did the vocals and guitar later when I got back to my studio, and um, Paul Simmons mixed it. So check it out. This is the most recent thing. It was recorded a few years ago. And uh, you know what? I'm going to go back to sleep. You guys listen. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with you? I say nothing. Check it out. Oh, yeah. I almost forgot. Alice gave me the idea for these lyrics. It's about two people that uh, can't live with each other, but they can't live without each other. No one else will have them, so they may as well get it together. So I got busy. And I wrote this song, and now I'm going back to sleep. Good night. I have, I have talked about this before. The mental image of Kane waking up on his couch, upside down, with his first thought being to grab his phone and record this commentary track, then going back to sleep, only to wake back up to record more of the commentary track, then once again going back to sleep, is the funniest thing ever to me. He's a sleepy boy, but his sleeping habits aside, or lack thereof, given his frequent usage of the quote, sleep, little slices of death, how I loathe thee, let's actually talk about this song. Being the most recent track on this album, 
Its earliest origins trace back to 2003, where it was teased on a fan site called kane-roberts.com, specifically for the Touched album that I mentioned earlier. Now, that's not to say that this version is from 2003. After all, the version from 2003 is a different version. In fact, in a Facebook post, Kane seems to mention this recording session, which in theory should be the exact date this session happened. January 17th, 2011. First off, <laughs> 17, like the winger song. If you know me personally, you'll know that I like to joke about that number a lot. Secondly, that is a day after Kane's birthday. He's just turned 49, and what does he do? He goes straight to the studio a day later. Thirdly, hey, Devil in 7! Arthur Funaro actually does play on this song here. He doesn't just co-write it. While Touched never released, despite having a full track list and all, Wrong is the one song that would actually get a proper release, escaping the fate that many of the songs planned to be on Touched would suffer as a result of it being canned. While you could argue that songs like Inside of You also escaped this fate, that doesn't mean that they got nearly the same luck as Wrong did. By the way, if you're curious about Touched, I made a video about it some time ago, so give it a watch at some point. As a result of its prominence, Wrong has quite a few versions. The teased demo from the Touched album, this version on Unsung Radio, and two versions on a later release of Kane's, 2019's The New Normal, where it gets a new recording and a remixed version that can be found on the Japanese release as a bonus track. I own that Japanese edition for the bonus track, by the way. I'll compare the versions briefly once I cover the Unsung Radio version first. As for this version, Kane notes that Paul Simmons drums on it and Kip Winger plays bass and sings backing vocals on it. And that's actually quite interesting. Kip does not play on either of the New Normals versions, and I'm not sure if he plays on the Touched version. But a Kane and Kip collaboration is always appreciated in my book. And as mentioned earlier, it seems Arthur Funaro also plays guitar on this track. It goes to show that Kane wasn't kidding when he said that this song was loaded with some serious talent. That on top of Alice Cooper giving Kane the idea for this song's lyrics, this song is just enriched with loads of badassery, and it's really no wonder how this song survived the doomed fate of the Touched album. The song starts with an acoustic guitar before the electric guitar kicks in. And the lyrics reflect exactly what Kane said this song was about. Two people that can't be with each other, but they can't be without each other. And with intense lyrics like, so beat me down and suck me dry and cut my dirty face, it really shows the unhealthy dynamic that the two characters have. Only to follow up with the reveal that there was once something there. As Kane asks, what happened to the days in the frozen snow, December is gone and different shows? Implying that while the peace at the start of this relationship was a lie in the end, it shows how it all started. And yet, while the structure of this relationship is weak, it clings desperately despite the pain and anguish it holds. This is such an interesting song in terms of Kane's songwriting, following themes that you can hear in songs such as Rebel Heart, Living a Lie, A Toxic Relationship. Before I go on to the next song, I do want to cover this song a bit more. For one, multiple versions. I need to talk about this. So as I said, four versions. Touched, Unsung Radio, and The New Normal has two versions with a regular and remixed version. But what if I told you there's potentially a fifth version? Yeah, I neglected to mention this in the Touched video. I was not as thorough as I should have been. But that aside, in videos from 2017, which were promoting a GoFundMe campaign that would fund music videos for his then upcoming album, The New Normal, you can hear what sounds like an early mix of wrong being used here. I won't cover the GoFundMe videos in depth, as I feel that's more suited for a video on The New Normal rather than this video, but when I found these videos, I immediately knew the song in the intro and end was the song Wrong. Makes sense, it's on the new normal after all. But then I later realized that it sounds different. This video uses what I'm pretty sure is an earlier mix of wrong. 
Additionally, Unsung Radio's version stands out in Kane's line delivery. While the Touched and the New Normal versions all share a similar delivery, going in a higher vocal range in the beginning, Unsung Radio actually starts with a lower register. I'll actually compare all of them now. Immediately, you can hear how it stands out. I'd compare all five versions here and now, but that could be a video of its own. Because, god, I am barely scratching the surface in the differences between these versions of Wrong. Like, come on, are you surprised? This song is over 20 years old. It is just barely younger than me. It is no surprise that this song has such a rich history in Kane's career. In short, one thing is for sure, each of these versions are unique in their own way, and I suggest you listen to all of them to give yourself a taste of how this song evolved. Because man did it evolve! Expect more on that in the New Normals video, because even the remix and the final mix of the New Normals version are different. Considerably so. It's a walking on shadows level deal. The things I do for this man. Hey, love makes you do crazy things as they say. But that's not the point of this video. Moving on, up next is a demo version of the song Rain, written by Kane Roberts. Only available on the 2-disc release, this song gives us an insight on how the song Rain evolved. And this makes me wish Kane would release more demos like this. In comparison to the final song, this demo seems to be in a higher key, and the drums seem to be from a drum machine if my ears don't deceive me. If I'm wrong, shoot me, but it would make sense given that this is a demo. Also, Kane's vocal delivery takes a different approach. Where the final version is softer in delivery, the demo is much stronger and his enunciation of words is different as well. Plus, the demo is much shorter, with getting into the lyrics and the meat of the song much quicker than the final release. And the gaps between the lyrics and the verses further explains this time difference. Let's compare the first verse of both versions. Yeah, the final one is way lengthier. Oh, and hilariously for some reason, the solo in both versions is actually about the same length. That is something that surprised me in comparing both versions of this song. Because, I mean, come on, it's a demo. The tempos of both versions of this song are also differed by a very sizable margin. Yet the solos are the same length, despite that. Also, the solos are completely different from each other, but that's to be expected. Additionally, the instrumental differences are plentiful, aside from what is probably a drum machine. No bongo sort of drums, the guitar isn't... What the hell is the term? See, me talking music is all fun in games until like, I get technical. Flame? Flangey? Warbly? Look, what I'm trying to say is that he doesn't seem to be using an effect pedal on the guitar in this demo. There, I got the point across, I hope. But seriously, it's cool seeing, or rather, hearing, the evolution of this song. I do wish Kane did talk about this version of Rain a bit more. 
How long before Under a Wild Sky is this demo? Who else is playing on this? As for which version I prefer, I think I'm quite happy with the direction Kane took the song in for the final mix. It's a song that actually calms me quite a bit, and I love how the final version of the song gives us more time to hear and appreciate the instrumentation of the song itself. But I also enjoy how the demo really shows the sound of the era it's from. After all, considering this predates Under a Wild Sky, you can hear that 90s sound clear as day here in a different way than the final release. Both of them, in their own special way, really have that 90s vibe in their sound. The demo especially feels like a song I could have heard when I was a little kid on a random CD, something I'd hear while running around in my childhood home. In a sense, it brings a warm feeling to me. It makes me feel nostalgic. Whereas the final release brings more fantasy into my mind, envisioning the sunset on a beach as it peeks through the clouds in a summer storm. It's hard to compare them when they bring such different emotions to me. Guitar Stroke 2 is, well, another little riff warm-up practice sort of session from Kane. Unsurprisingly, this is only available on the two-disc edition of Unsung Radio. I don't have that much to say on this. I mean, it does appear in an interview Kane did with Rick Drazen some time ago, if that's noteworthy enough. It is nice to have more of Kane's guitarmanship, though, so I'll take it. Self Control is up next, written by Kane Roberts and Jim Peterick. It's only available on the two disc edition of Unsung Radio, and this song has a funny saga behind it for me. Okay, so I have all of Kane's discography on my laptop. I have for a long time, mostly because, hey, I may as well, even if it was through unsavory means. Yar har har, if you catch my drift. I know, piracy. But given that I fully intend on buying these albums anyways down the line, plus the fact that buying these albums never directly gives Kane the money as all of them are secondhand, yeah. Some of this is, I need this for research. Others were, this is a package deal, so hey, the more the merrier, nice bonus type of deal. I found the two-disc version of Unsung Radio, which was nice, but never looked at the songs closely because, well, Unsung Radio was one of the things that was, oh, nice bonus, I'm here for this thing, though, but nice to have this with it. One day, I compiled a playlist of someone else's uploads of Unsung Radio. After all, they hadn't done so themselves, so I was like, hey, fuck it, may as well. But shortly after this, I happened to be looking at my files for Unsung Radio on my laptop. And then I noticed there was a track that I had that wasn't in this playlist. Self-Control. It was at that moment that I realized I would have to upload it myself. But the thing was, is that I took a while to do this for whatever reason, but that was because I wanted to upload the entirety of Unsung Radio myself. And eventually, I did do that in a little fan project of mine that I'll cover later, but in the end, I did rectify the issue. That's the funny story of self-control. Just finding it on accident on my laptop, not knowing it existed until I looked in my laptop. Wonderful, I know. Now, for the song itself. Immediately, the sound of the song itself reminds me of White Trash from the Saints and Sinners bonus tracks, a song that also appears on the third release of Unsung Radio, and this makes a lot of sense given it's a Jim Peterick co-written song. 1992. White Trash originates from 1991. Dirty Blonde also has some similar instrumentation, which is from 1993. This gives us the general sound of Kane's musical style post Saints and Sinners and pre Under a Wild Sky. I'll be damned. The song follows a classic theme for Kane, sex and power, something prevalent in his songs from the very beginning with his 1987 debut album. Lyrics like, I'm gonna watch the fire tear you up inside, just shows the fire of passion in such a dynamic way, as Kane sings about falling into temptation, questioning if he'll make it to midnight on this runaway train. Are you close enough to feel the flame? 
Well, I know I am, because damn, Kane knows how to write this stuff. And the bridge really pumps you up as Kane goes, shout it out, let it go. God, I love this song. The piano in the intro, how his vocals deepen with the verses. What isn't there to like here? The one note I want to mention is that this song, much like Guns of Paradise, doesn't feel like it would have worked on Under a Wild Sky. Again, the sound of the song is too different from most of Under a Wild Sky, which is something given the variety of the songs on the album, but this feels further removed from what Under a Wild Sky became. But it does show off Kane was writing a huge variety of songs during 1992. Guns of Paradise and Blue Highway may feel like they mesh together, but then you have songs like Reckless and Walk and Self Control. It's kind of bizarre that these songs are all from the same time as each other. Kane's versatility shows, and Unsung Radio is such a perfect showcase of how his versatility has evolved through the years. Up next is a demo version of In Another Life, written by Kane Roberts. Only available on the two disc release, this song does have a commentary track paired with it, unlike Rain's demo. So I'll let Kane go first. After you, big guy. I've added In Another Life and Rain um, in demo form because I wanted you to see some of the uh, stages that songs go through before they end up in the studio for real. Um, it's a lot of things about these versions that I do like, uh, you know, that kind of uh, innocent approach. But I think uh, what's most evident is on In Another Life, you can see uh, my love for Jimi Hendrix's guitar playing. Anyway, um, take a look. You can compare it to the version that's uh, on the Phoenix Down CD that's included in this package. Take a look. Kane talks about a lot of points that mirror my thoughts on the demos being here. And I like it. He and I have a similar thought process when it comes to this stuff. And it's something that has provided a lot of luck in me finding this stuff and documenting it. Kane has, one way or another, made it much easier for me to access this stuff. Because he thinks of similar things that I do when it comes to his music. The way it evolves in the process of being made, and he provides more in-depth insight because, well, he's the one who made the songs. And while Kane doesn't discuss much about the song itself, he does mention it shows off his fondness for Jimi Hendrix's guitarmanship. So hey, that's something. We get to hear a specific influence to pick up on in this song. Also, Kane says we can compare this to the final version of this song. Oh, Kane, you know me so well. No, really, he does. Anyways, the demo. So, for one, they're in different keys from each other. The way I found this out was so funny, though. Throughout me writing this script, I have been comparing versions of songs on Sony Vegas, overlaying them on top of each other, putting one version in one ear, playing them back to back, comparing wavelengths, the song lengths, the whole gambit. Playing the intros on top of each other for the demo and final mix was the worst thing ever. They are in different keys. Do you want to hear what I heard? Because here, I'm warning you, it is not pleasant. Do not play these over each other. This is why. See, you can imagine that this is the funniest thing to hear when I was working on this script. Good God. Okay, as for more differences, In Another Life and Rain's demos actually have the same drum sound. And now I feel confident in saying it's a drum machine because it is too uniform to be anything but that. Which again makes sense, this is a demo, drum machines can be incredibly useful in that process. If you've got the tech, use it! Weirdly though, this demo does have a bongo drum in it, which I say is weird because Rain lacks this, despite the final version of Rain having it. And then the final version of In Another Life doesn't have a bongo drum, which is also weird. I wonder if Rain and In Another Life are a bit closer in connection as a result, actually. Maybe that's why they're included as demos here. Theory aside, this version also feels much more bare bones in the chorus, and I'll play both versions of the chorus here to show off what I mean. I'll be right there waiting outside. I know you cried a hundred thousand tears. Why did you lie to yourself for years? Well, cry all you wanna, but just wait. In another life, you live somewhere. 
See what? Okay, sorry. Hear what I mean? Also, this demo has the opposite deal of Rain's demo. The final version is actually shorter than the demo. In Another Life and Rain mirror each other in such odd ways with how they are in comparison to their demos. It's strange, but interesting. As for which version I prefer, I think I really like the demo a bit more. Not to say the final version is bad, I am- I'm not saying that. What I want to say is that the demo feels a lot more personal. Hearing Kane's voice more on its own as opposed to harmonizing in the chorus, the instrumentation really driving us home since this was before it was taken to the studio. It makes this song more heart-wrenching in a lot of ways. But again, much like Rain, the demo and final versions have such different feels to them. So much so that it almost feels unfair to compare them to one another. At the end of the day, it's an insight on the development of this song, and honestly, I'm happy that Kane put these here. Kane, if you're watching, thank you. I mean it. I am such a sucker for this sort of thing as a music geek. I may not be a technical type of music geek, but I am a sentimental type of music geek. A historical music geek, even. Getting insight on the timeline of songs that I love is one of the greatest joys I can experience in listening to music, grasping a deeper understanding of what went into these songs. So Kane, please, release more of the demo versions of these songs. I beg of you. I'm Waiting For You is up next, written by Kane Roberts. And hey, guess what? This song has a commentary track. Take it away, Kane. Okay, so it's heartbreak time. Um, earlier today, I was driving through Sherman Oaks. It's a little town right next to uh, Hollywood. And I drove by the Guitar Center. Above the Guitar Center, there's photos of some of the biggest guitar heroes to ever walk the earth. And one of the photos is of Jeff Beck. And uh, it made me think about my Les Paul. I had a 20th anniversary Les Paul with uh, rewired Jeff Beck humbucker pickups. I used to carry it around with me all the time when I'd go on tour because it was kind of my l good luck charm, you know. Just wanted it with me no matter where I went. I'd had it since I was a kid. And uh, I remember waking up. It was maybe a few days after I got home after the second Alice Cooper tour. And I realized that uh, I didn't know where my Les Paul was. And a lot of times when the, the equipment comes in transit um, from being on the road, it ends up going to a storage facility, and then they deliver it to your place. Well, my Les Paul never came back, so somehow it got stolen or I lost it. Um, if anybody knows where it is, maybe drop me a line, tell me how she's doing. You know, you can keep it and keep playing it, but um, that's not the point. This may be the only song that features that guitar. It's called I'm Waiting For You. I must have been in my 20s. It was the first time my band ended up on the radio. So we delivered it to the station and we ran home and we sat in front of the radio. And uh, yeah, we were totally jazzed when we finally came on and we thought, you know, hey, we've hit the big time. Anyway, check this one out. Just remember my Les Paul and you can shed a tear with me. Aw, Kane's blonde Les Paul. We get to hear it on this song. I still wish he could be reunited with that guitar. Which, by the way, I need to mention this. Kane says he carried that guitar with him on tour. And believe it or not, there's photo evidence. On stage, there's photos of this very guitar being part of the stage set. Who would have guessed?
guessed. Not me, because I just assumed he had it in the hotel and tour bus. Nope. It was on stage with him, too. Now, this song... This song is interesting, because not only does it have a different version that could be found on the 2012 reissue of Saints and Sinners, but Kane has talked a bit more about this song, both online and in the Saints and Sinners reissue's liner notes. First, let me cover the reissue's description for this song, even if it's for a different version of it. Yeah, me in my early 20s, feeling like it was all in front of me. For this demo, I was in Bearsville Studios in New York with real talent on every inch of this recording. Strange joint that Bearsville studio. The place was crawling with real hippies and freaks, and in the middle of a session, the drummer for Frank Zappa's original band would drop in. Maybe Todd Rundgren or Mick Jagger would swing by. I was like a kid in awe of everyone and just amazed at every moment of every freaking day. I believe this was one of the songs that Bob Ezrin heard that inspired him to tell Alice about me. I included this demo because it just captures a moment in time right before things went into hyperdrive. Then in a post on Facebook, he talks about this song, in which he says something I need to clear up a bit. Let me read a post from Kane back when he posted this song on Facebook in 2015. A few days ago, I got the news that drummer Victor Russo had died. He was a key player in my band in New York called Criminal Justice back in the day before hooking with Alice Cooper. Alice and I recorded a lot of demos in his garage studio in upstate New York, and Victor also played on my first major release on MCA. Great guy, great drummer, great singer. The photo below includes the members of CJ, left to right. Russ Bernier, extremely melodic, talented guitarist, Greg Jackson, dangerously skilled bass player with a dangerous brain, and my bud Victor, massive cool drummer. His friendship and creative voice will not be forgotten. Our first demo, Waiting For You, from those days as kids playing clubs. Criminal justice. Well, okay, the drummer and bassist are right for a criminal justice lineup. After all, believe it or not, criminal justice has had more than the power trio lineup of Kane, Victor, and Steve Steele which was mentioned back in the day in magazines. But Russ Bernier being noted here indicates that this is not criminal justice. Yeah, I'm Waiting For You is not from criminal justice. It's actually from a band that came before criminal justice. Skywire, a band of canes that was around in the early 80s. This is also not the only Skywire song that is available to hear, and I'll cover that shortly, but Kane has often mixed up Skywire and Criminal Justice as recently as 2022 in his third interview with Ryan Roxy. And that makes sense, as they happened back to back and had shared band members. Kane's memory is not photographic, unlike mine. I mentioned that this song has a different version that is available to hear, the version on the bonus disc for 2012's Saints and Sinners reissue. And I want to talk about it a bit because the version on Saints and Sinners' reissue seems to be an earlier version. Less ad-libs, a slower tempo. It adds up, truthfully. I covered both versions in my Saints and Sinners video, but I'd still like to cover it here. This song is likely from 1982, or at least this version of it is. A bit later on in Skywire's lifetime, and a later version as I have theorized, it would make the most sense for it to fall in line with the next song I'll cover. And this song is such a favorite for me. Kane's vocals, obviously being pre-vocal training, his solo here, the way he cries out before the solo, and this song really, really makes it so easy for Kane to steal my heart more than he already has. These arms want to hold you close to me will forever make me melt. Also, the intro of this song makes me perk up every time. A few of Kane's songs do this to me, and this is one of them. It's like when you shine a laser out for a cat and their pupils go all big. That. That is what the intro of this song makes me feel. Interestingly, this version likes keyboards, which the Saints and Sinners reissue version does have. 
I'm not sure why this was removed, but in truth, I don't know how Keyboard would fit in the Unsung Radio release of it. So hey, maybe it's for the better. Now, I don't think I covered which version I preferred in my Saints and Sinners video, and I'll do so now. I think I have to go with this version. I like the faster tempo, and plus, it was the version I heard first. And again, both versions have a different feel. This version gives me the vibe of Kane being on stage, calling to me from the stage in full theatrics. The Saints and Sinners version gives me more of a movie scene version, where a tough guy with a soft spot deep down flirts with the girl. Both versions are great in their own way, once again. Finally, we have the song Louise, written by Kane Roberts. Available on the two-disc release and second single-disc release of Unsung Radio, this song is one that I have a funny story with. This goddamn song. At least once a week, I'll be minding my business. And what happens? Kane fucking comes swinging into my head going, Hey, Louise! And I sit there like, Kane, is now the time for this? Is it? The answer is always yes. It is always time for Louise to be stuck in my goddamn head. This has been going on for ages. I cannot escape Louise, and I don't think I want to. There's a lot I have to dive into for the song, by the way. So, this is the other Skywire song that I mentioned, and this is interesting. For one, the solo in this song is not Kane's. It's Russ's. Skywire had the two of them switch duties on guitar like that, and I enjoy it since it spices things up. But there's more. What if I told you... There's video of Skywire. What if I told you that this song had a music video of sorts? Well, it does. This right here is Kane Roberts, pre-Alice Cooper, with his band Skywire. 1982. Kane has a fair bit of muscle by this point, and hey! He's playing without a pick. And here you thought the only time he did that was in Alice Cooper's music video for Freedom. Ha! You'd be mistaken. Hell, I was mistaken because I was taken aback by the lack of guitar pick here, which seems to be intentional unlike Freedom's ordeal, where the editors chose to use the takes where Kane had accidentally dropped his guitar pick. Kane also has a guitar here that I've never seen him with before or after this, and I can't help but wonder where it went. It does show that Kane has a favorite type of guitar shape, because when compared to guitars like his Kramer Voyagers shortly after this era, and his Schecter E1s years later in 2022, there is a similarity. But yeah, there's Skywire! Kane, Russ, Victor, and Greg. Well, Kane wasn't Kane yet, but that's not the point. Effectively, this is Skywire. Who would have thought that Skywire would get so much representation on this album when it's such an obscure facet of Kane's career? Oh, and speaking of freedom, since I drew the comparison with the lack of a guitar pick, that's not where the similarities end, because there's a familiar lyric in this song. I'll play it paired with freedom for ya. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can tell Kane had heavy involvement with Freedom's lyrics here. And that makes me love Freedom even more than I already did. Ah, but I'm not done yet with the background of this song. Some of you may actually recognize this song for a totally different reason. Pat Travers. Kane gave a few songs to Pat for his Hot Shot album in 1984. Louise, In the Heat of the Night, and Women on the Edge of Love. Women on the Edge of Love would actually wind up on Kane's 1987 album, and Louise finally got a release here on Unsung Radio. As for In the Heat of the Night, well, 
I know a bit more about that. While it isn't particularly relevant to Unsung Radio, I still feel this needs to be brought to light, and as such, here's this little side tangent. It turns out this song was slated to be on Kane's first album before being cut under a different title, To the Beat of the Night. I was shown a promotional tape for Kane's debut album by Andy Michael, an Alice Cooper superfan who I met through finding a photo of him with Kane and Alice back in the 80s. He said that he was given this tape by Brian Renfield Nelson, which showcases a slightly different track list, with the most notable difference being To the Beat of the Night. At the moment, I do not have a proper high quality rip of this song, and Andy has said that he is unsure on if it would be okay to upload due to potential copyright ordeals. But I promise you, I will continue to work on finding a way to make this song available for my fellow Kane fans. And when I do, I will cover it alongside the rest of Kane's 1987 debut album. Now, for Louise itself. This song is a classic sort of rockin' tune, with a catchy chorus that is just so easy to sing along to. That early 80s rock sound. And it shows us Kane stepping back from the spotlight for a moment for Russ to take the solo instead. This is very unique in that regard, as all of Kane's other songs have Kane doing the guitar solo in some regard. Even King of the World on his 2019 The New Normal has Kane doing a solo alongside Nina Strauss. This song, as far as I am aware, is the only Kane song that has him outright not taking the guitar solo on himself. His vocals here are, of course, pre-vocal training. This is a given purely because vocal training was Saints and Sinners era for Kane. But vocally, he takes a rougher approach to this than he does for I'm Waiting For You. And it makes sense given the different vibes these two songs have. Louise is focused more on the lust and desire side of things, while I'm Waiting For You is full of yearning and passion. And as Kane sings in that song, it's rapping out a rhythm of love. I am not sorry, I cannot resist referencing these lyrics. Hell, I think this makes me feel confident that the unsung radio version of I'm Waiting For You is a later version of that song, whereas the Saints and Sinners bonus track version is an earlier version. Because the instrumental sound and quality actually sounds pretty similar here. If you told me that Louise and unsung radio's version of I'm Waiting For You were outright from the same studio session? I would believe you in a heartbeat. I can also fully confirm that the unsung radio version is, in fact, not an earlier or later version of Louise in comparison to the version that is found in that Skywire video. They are the same version of Louise. Let me play a snippet from the video and then the unsung radio release for you guys to prove my point. Told ya! This leads me to believe that there is only one version of Kane's take on the song Louise. I'd say only one version of Louise, but that would be misleading and would ignore the Pat Travers version. But Kane only did one version of Louise. Now, while I couldn't see this song making it onto Kane's debut album, even with songs like If This Is Heaven or Too Much For Anyone To Touch having similar themes in their lyrics, I still wonder if it was ever considered as a potential track for that album. I'd understand why it was cut if it was ever considered in the first place, but considering two out of three Kane songs that have a Pat Travers connection almost made it onto his debut album, with one of them actually making the final cut, it would be strange to me if it wasn't at least considered as a potential song to be added. And with that, that is all of the new songs for Unsung Radio. What a killer bunch of songs! But now with that covered, I feel it is necessary to cover the promotion of this album. How beneficial was the promotion it got? Let's dive into it. This album was the third of Kane's albums to have promotion involved with the internet. 
And I say third purely because of the ordeal of Touched, which while it didn't release, it was a full album, unlike Flesh FX, which was also advertised online. So I guess technically this is the fourth music project that Kane had promoted online. Technicalities aside, as this album didn't get released on a huge label of sorts, promotion was pretty much left to Kane and Bruce. And honestly, I'd argue that this may be one of the best promoted albums of Kane's discography. Kane prominently advertising it on his site, paired with his recent appearance at Firefest at the time, which was the perfect timing since all eyes were on Kane after that. Bruce actively sharing it around online and actually doing what most record labels didn't actually fucking do for Kane in his past endeavors. The two of them selling a limited release of 500 copies of the two disc set, which gives it that rarity factor that would undoubtedly increase the demand. Kane posting about it pretty heavily on Facebook, to where he gave more information on some of these songs. Considering how Kane got pretty much fucked over with his other albums, Unsung Radio arguably got the best deal. A record label that actually believed in the project put real passion into it, alongside distribution sharing that same passion. Paired with a reinvigorated fanbase that was bound to be receptive to this release, the stars had aligned perfectly, and this was what really got Kane back into the swing of things. This is how Kane's album should have been promoted pre and post Unsung Radio. I say post because you saw how the new normal went, Again, expect a bandit rant. Because I feel like if the new normal got this amount of passion and energy from Frontiers, maybe we would have gotten more for the album. Maybe more full music videos. Maybe some live shows. I don't know. All I know is that for once in Kane's solo career, the ball wasn't dropped here promotionally. In fact, Unsung Radio was promoted so well that I often see some Kane fans actually misattribute Under a Wild Sky songs as being from Unsung Radio. If that doesn't show that Unsung Radio got pushed into the spotlight and got some proper notice, I don't know what does. But this does leave me with some notes that I need to touch on. For one, I'd like to lay out the full chronological order of the origins of these songs. Let's get this done. In order from oldest to newest, First we have I'm Waiting For You and Louise, having origins in Kane's pre-Alice Cooper band Skywire, with the likeliest year being 1982, given Louise having a music video originating from that year, and Skywire's timeline being 1981 to 1983. Next up we have One Step to Heaven, I Bleed For You, and In the City of Pain in one session, alongside House Burning Down, being from 1989. White Trash is from 1991 according to the liar notes of the 2012 reissue of Saints and Sinners, and Walking on Shadows has origins from the same year within its connection to the Saints and Sinners track Too Far Gone. Unless Too Far Gone has origins that are from before 1991, it is safe to say that Walking on Shadows can be estimated to originate from 1991. Additionally, with the re-recording of Rebel Heart, that song also has origins in 1991 with the re-recording falling later into the timeline. Reckless, Walk, Love Gone Wrong, Blue Highway, Guns of Paradise, and Self Control, all being Jim Peterick co writes, originate from 1992, as that is when their writing sessions together occurred. In Another Life, Rain, Blind, and Alive and Well aren't clear in where they fall into the timeline, but one can assume they fall somewhere between 1992 and 1999. Rebel Heart, as I mentioned earlier, likely has origins in 1991, but as we're covering the re-recording for Under a Wild Sky, this more than likely originates from 1999. Dirty Blonde is the only song that falls into 1993 for this timeline, as stated by the liner notes for the 2012 reissue of Saints and Sinners. Wrong, while it has origins from 2003 in Touched, this version seems to originate from 2011. And last, but not least, the commentary and guitar stroke tracks are probably from 2012, given that they're specifically made for unsung radio. Ah, there we go. A nice comprehensive timeline. Let's see, what's next? Ah, I get to talk about a little thing I made. Right. Okay, so as I mentioned, unsung radio has a unique ordeal. With the different editions that were released, all of them have differing track lists. There's even songs exclusive to specific editions, such as the demos of Rain and In Another Life. 
or even house burning down or self-control. What if you want to have it all in one place? Well, that's where I come in. Back in 2022, I found myself yet again thinking about Unsung Radio. It was still something that eluded me. So much of it was a mystery still, and worse yet, no one had uploaded self-control properly onto YouTube. So I took matters into my own hands in December of 2022. Unsung Radio Deluxe. The ultimate culmination of everything Unsung Radio has to offer, and more. Not only does it have every song found on every edition of Unsung Radio, commentary, tracks, and all as well, it offers some missing cuts and bonus cuts. For one, I have made sure to include Neverland in this playlist. Additionally, both versions of Walking on Shadows are included, and the Under a Wild Sky re-recording of You Always Want It is added to make sure that the Under a Wild Sky portion of Unsung Radio is truly the reissue that it could be. But that's not all, because I haven't covered the bonus cuts. The 2012 Saints and Sinners reissue version of Waiting For You is included here, and then as an added bonus that I felt would be a special treat, the original 1991 versions of Rebel Heart and You Always Want It. Together, this makes for a deluxe version of this album, one that I am proud to have pulled together. I must stress, however, that Unsung Radio Deluxe, in no shape or form, is an official release. This is a fan-made project by yours truly, and I want to stress that in no way was this created by Kane Roberts or Bruce Mee. If I somehow see anyone make the claim that this is an official release, then I must ask two things. One, what the fuck, why are you spreading misinformation? And two, where the fuck is my money? I kid, I kid. Well, about the money anyways, don't spread misinformation or I'm gonna bite you. But seriously, Unsung Radio Deluxe is simply a passion project that I did on total impulse. If you'd like the fullest experience of Unsung Radio and then some, please go give it a look. Well, that's that. The Unsung Radio video. Done at last. But what do I think of this album? As you'd expect, I adore Unsung Radio. It is such a wonderful representation of so many of Kane's eras through his career at the time. Whether it's pre-Alice Cooper with songs like Louise and I'm Waiting For You, pre-Saints and Sinners or even mid-Hiatus era, you are getting a hefty dose of Kane. And paired with Kane providing commentary on these songs? I have never seen an artist do something like this in my life. I've never seen Kiss do this. Not even Alice Cooper. Kane made this album incredibly interesting, and furthermore, made it so fun for me to dig into. Along with Unsung Radio bringing Kane fully back onto the grid, I hold this album close to me. Unsung Radio is a key part of Kane's career, and it's something that needs to be acknowledged more. To me, without Unsung Radio, I don't think we'd have nearly as much from Kane as we do in modern times. Before I end this video, I would like to thank both Kane and Bruce for providing me with answers on my questions about Unsung Radio, along with their work on this album to begin with. Seriously, thank you both. Without you guys, not only would us Kane fans not have such a killer collection of songs to enjoy, but I also wouldn't have been able to make this video. Now, without further ado, this has been Vain Bandit. As Kane Roberts would say, rock the fuck on.